Welcome to Uprising, Setsu and Susan. Thank Thank you. you. Thanks so much for joining us. Well, this uh, documentary, Visions of Abolition, uh, features a number of voices, uh, in particular yours, Susan Burton. Can can you begin by setting the stage for our listeners um, for how you have become involved in A New Way of Life and and this work by sharing your own personal story, how a, a personal tragedy led you toward addiction and then incarceration? Yeah. My uh, five-year-old son was accidentally killed by an LAD, LAPD officer. And um, the death, the loss of my son just sent me into a tailspin of grief, depression, and uh, I drank to cope with it. How long ago was this? That was 1982. And it was in the height of the war on drugs, and um, I eventually began to use cocaine, crack cocaine. Our communities had been saturated with the uh, substance, and uh, I used it. As a result of using it, I was imprisoned and sent um, to prison many, many times. Uh, for a 15-year period, I had was sentenced six times to prison for drug possession. And um, I got uh, some help after all of those prison sentences in a, a community, Santa Monica. And the help with the addiction and therapy and um, getting set me on a path to healing And um, I just reflected during the period on how the criminal justice system had dealt with my loss, my grief, my addiction. It was so uh, inhumane and torturous what I'd went through when something like recovery was at the fingertips of, you know, other parts of the community, other parts of Los Angeles. And I thought, what a shame that I had to be in prison, tortured, caged. And um, because I dealt with my grief with illegal substances. So um, eventually what I did, you know, not eventually, but shortly after, was to think of how I could help many, many, many other women, you know, that were just like me, had resulted to use uh, 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 illegal substance, had fell into the trap of the war on drugs in our communities. And, you know, I set on a path to sort of make a difference. Mm. Uh, Setsu, how how did you get involved in A New Way of Life? And what led you to make this film? You're a professor at UC Riverside. Well, I began working as a volunteer educator at A New Way of Life since 2005. With and this is Susan's organization. That's yeah. right, with yes. the LEAD Project. And what the LEAD Project is, it's it's a collaboration with A New Way of Life and the Los Angeles Chapter of Critical Resistance. And it's a political education project for the women residents at A New Way of Life. And um, two of the residents um, who were interns with the LEAD Project, Patricia Naki and Camille Watkins, had started a videography project about the effects of police violence in Watts. And um, I volunteered to find a film student at UCR to help them edit their 10-minute short. Um, And the student who volunteered was Cameron Granadino. But then due to technical difficulties, we were not able to finish that project, but it became the inspiration and the kind of catalyst for us to, you know, think about making a documentary on the prison um, industrial complex from an abolitionist perspective. And we decided that this was really needed to advance the movement um, because when people hear about prison abolition, oftentimes they think, you know, oh, that's such a utopic idea. There's no way that it's viable. How are we going to provide safety and security? So one of the goals of the fo- of the film was to elaborate the meaning of abolition and what that actually looks like on the ground. Mm. And we decided to tell that story through the life work of Susan Burton, whose work at A New Way of Life is an example of prison abolition in practice as a better alternative to the prison system. Mm. Well, Susan, you as a, as a woman um, were 
in a situation where instead of getting the help, as you mentioned, you were simply thrown into prison. And, and some, often when we think about our prison system today, we think about uh, mostly men being incarcerated, particularly black men being incarcerate, incarcerated. But how deeply are women affected, not only those in prison, but those who are left outside uh, with their family members indoors and also uh, imprisoned? And also, how are women violated in prison in a way that most Americans, if they knew, would be horrified? Oh, the violations are many and at many different degrees. Um, I can remember being held in a prison and um, taking a shower while guards just walked by the shower. Male guards? Male guards. Male guards, female guards. Uh, there being plexiglass mm -hmm. in front of a shower that was a multiple person shower. There were six of us able to shower at one time. And there just being plexiglass at the front of the shower and male guards being able to walk by. I remember uh, male guards bringing treats in for other women like barbecue or uh, fried chicken and um, those exchanges being really personal with, uh, with people. Uh, I remember being stripped down and, and put into a big room with maybe 30 other women and male guards having, you know, ability to just walk, you know, through where we were stripped down. In uh, CIW, there's a little hole in each door that um, we, uh, of our, of our, of our rooms and um, there's a, a toilet in the room and then there's two bunks and male guards just walk down the hall at any given moment and peek into the rooms. Um, being in prison was such a, via, via, a, a personal violation of one's persons, one's emotions, one's ability to have any uh, sort of uh, privacy or um, you uh, or um, oh my God! Just sitting here talking about it mm -hmm. brings back such um, sadness and uh, emotional um, harm. You know, uh, it's it's horrible mm -hmm. what we subject people to uh, in uh, the prisons in the U.S. Just horrible. Said so you you made this documentary Visions of Abolition featuring Susan, featuring Angela Davis, Ruthie Gilmore, um, Andrea Smith, Dylan Rodriguez, a number of people involved in critical resistance and the prison abolition movement. Um, and and one of the really interesting things was the links between um, uh, between American history and what's happening currently with the prison industrial complex, uh, with slavery and with. Uh, how African Americans are disproportionately jailed because of drug sentencing laws. You throw out some very disturbing s statistics on the screen. Uh, tell our listeners a little bit about how clearly these drug sentencing disparities are linked to this racial overrepresentation of African Americans in American prisons. Okay, sure. Well, the film is uh, designed um, in two parts. In the first part of the film, it really kind of describes the problem. It's called breaking down the prison industrial complex. And as you said, you know, we link it to slavery, to capitalism, gender violence, and the war on drugs. And so, for example, we seek to educate, you know, what these racial disparities actually look like. And some of the, the statistics we provide are, for example, 75% of the nation's drug users are white, and African Americans make up 15% of those drug users, yet they comprise 74% of those sent to prison. So clearly, um, this disparity, you know, regarding um, you know, the drug users and who gets locked up for substance abuse and drug-related um, 
uh, crimes, uh, you know, there is this gross racial disparity. So, so from the time one is arrested, mm-hmm. because even the, the, even amongst those who are arrested versus right. those who are actually con- convicted and, and sentenced, sentenced to prison, prison right. something's happening that sort of, um, you know, that's sort of filtering out a larger percentage of white drug users right. and keeping in um, African American drug users. Absolutely. So another statistic that we provide in the film is the fact that two thirds of those arrested in this country are white people, yet two thirds of those who end up inside prison are people of color, black, Mm. mostly black and brown, and obviously poor white people as well. So we have to understand that in that process of the so-called criminal justice system, the ways in which the laws operate and then the ways in which the legal system works were affects this kind of racial disparity. Hmm. Uh, Susan Burton, you, in, in, through your journey from where you started to, to starting a new way of life um, and, and to becoming involved with critical resistance, um, uh, what do you mean when you say today that you are a prison abolitionist? That The term abolitionist, of course, has a very strong historical context. Yes, well... You know, I, I went to a conference in uh, New Orleans with Critical Resistance and was exposed to the alternatives and different um, ways that we could address uh, social harms, crime, injustices. And when I say prison abolitionists, I say that no one should be put into a cage, that there are other ways to deal with crime and other ways to deal with um, social problems than locking someone up, chaining them up, uh, and treating them uh, with such uh, torturous conditions. Um, just a minute ago, I couldn't pull up the word that I felt, but it was the shame mm. of being exposed. It was the uh, uh, inability to even have a voice to object to being shamed and exposed. You know, as a woman, you are... Um, as, as, a, as, a, as a child, my mom said, you know, um, have some pride. Um, don't expose yourself, you know, and you have no, no recourse as to uh, protecting yourself and not being shamed uh, in the process. So uh, I needed to get that in there. Mm-hmm. So, so let's talk about the, um, the the project that your organization, A New Way of Life, along with Critical Resistance, started. Uh, Susan called Lead. Uh, what does Lead stand for, and uh, and and what exactly? How exactly do you, through that project, envision alternatives to yeah. the prison system? So, leadership. Lead stands for leadership, education, uh, advocacy, and action. Um, I mean, I'm sorry, leadership, education, uh, action, and dialogue. Mm-hmm. So the LEAD project uh, gives um, uh, the residents of a new way of life uh, the ability to imagine different, um, different, you know, different uh, mo- alternatives to incarceration. It gives the opportunity to look at, you know, what does the prison industrial complex thrive on? How does it operate? What are the mechanisms that feeds it? What are the mechanisms that sustains it? And how do we approach um, uh, uh, combating those mechanisms? You know, it uh, allows women to have the experience of creating a film um, we've sat in the room, in the living room of a new way of life and created the community we envision we'd like to live in. So having that sort of ability to uh, create something different, to be educated about why it exists, why it thrives, why it uh, uh, picks on uh, communities, low-income communities, what, how it how it operates. And um, to broaden the perspective, because when I went to prison, Sonali, I thought it was my fault. I own the failure of a failed citizen that's been cast off by its peers. Uh, Through education, political education, through understanding the broader uh, um, uh, dynamics, 
it allowed me to forgive and heal and then get on a path to help others to be a part of a solution. Mm -hmm. Setsu, let's talk about following from what Susan has just been discussing, uh, these concepts now of restorative or rehabilitative justice versus what we have today, which is a sort of retributive system. We, someone commits a crime, uh, we t toss him away and, and lock up the key. Um, what exactly does um, critical resistance and a new way of life um, uh, imagine? Because when we when we hear, again, as Susan was saying, when you hear the term abolition, um, we think of, well, let's just end all prisons. And as your film shows, um, uh, some of the folks that you interview say that, well, it's not just about, it, it's, it, it doesn't mean let's break down the walls and let everybody loose, and then we'd have you know the, the kind of world we want to live in. It's much more complex than that. Definitely. So the second half of the film really focuses on elaborating what we mean by abolition in the broadest sense, which really does mean envisioning a whole different kind of society that's not based on, you know, greed, exploitation, you know, individualism, and so on. But it definitely goes to show that um, this system is broken and the current system is not providing us with real justice and security. So given the fact that the system is not providing us with justice, Justice and security. Um, we are talking about a different kind of accountability system that would be um, much more informed with getting to the roots of what is causing the problems. You know, what is causing these certain these these so-called crimes? What is causing people to do harm? And we would seek, you know, to get to the to get um, to the root of the problem and seek to heal the problem rather than just punishing the symptom, right, of these larger right. socio economic, you know, psychological, mental health issues, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So those, th so we, I think we really just need to shift the approach so that in terms of thinking about um, restorative justice and other forms of um, community accountability, we want to attempt to reduce the harm that's being done, and certainly we all want to be safe. We want our families, loved ones to be safe. Um, you know, I'm a mother of two children, so clearly we want to create a society in which, you know, we can live together, we can coexist, That, uh, but that um, this current system is just reproducing a cycle of violence and not getting to the root of why we have so many problems in our right. current system. We want our children to not uh, land in prison, but we also don't want our children to be killed by a murderer. And and so let me ask, Susan, uh, ask you this question, which is, there's been a lot of discussion, of course, of the tragic murder of Trayvon Martin, the 17-year-old African-American uh, boy in Florida, and there have been outraged calls across the country for the arrest and uh, imprisonment of George Zimmerman, uh, the man who is uh, suspected of killing him. How would you respond, and when you hear that, how do you respond as someone who who I'm sure is also outraged by Trayvon Martin's murder. Yeah, I um, I believe there should be some accountability as to what happened, but there also should also needs to be a deeper look into why this person um, uh, followed him just because he was a young black male. What um, what prompted him to feel automatically that he was doing something wrong and needed to be um, followed and um, and 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 eventually shot? So um, what's going on in that community? That that's the type of attitude of their community watch. What's going on in that community that uh, a civilian community watch guy would be on watch with a pistol? So there needs to be a whole deeper look into the culture of that gated community, into the mentality of the, uh, the, the guy that uh, shot him. Um, I can't think of his George name. George Zimmerman. George Zimmerman. And, um, uh, and there needs to be some accountability to that family. So does that mean George Zim Zimmerman needs to be put into a cage and uh, stripped and humiliated? I don't think so. But there does need to be a level of accountability and some um, uh, healing done for the family. Uh, the community, both the community that's calling for action 
and the community in which George Zimmerman uh, uh, was supported to have a gun on a neighborhood, in a neighborhood, in a gated community as a neighborhood watch volunteer. Mm -hmm. So there needs to be some deep um, uh, looks, look and, and approaches to what happened there in Florida. And I know what it's like to lose a child. Right. And I feel so bad for the mother and the father. Um, the the police the policeman that killed my son, you know, uh, never ever said he was sorry. The wow. police department never ever said they were sorry. There was no level of accountability. And what happened is that I went into a self-destructive mode. Well, I took it upon myself when I got support and help to get on a path of healing and forgiveness and um, uh, empower, and I was empowered through that. But these are um, solutions that people have to be willing to look for and work towards. Mm -hmm. Finally, uh, Setsu, where can listeners find out more about your film, Visions of Abolition? Is it going to be available for people to get copies of, or will there be screenings? Yes, well, we've had quite a few local screenings here um, in the Los Angeles and uh, Inland Empire, but anyone can go to visionsofabolition.org. That's one word, visionsofabolition.org, and um, uh, purchase a copy of the DVD uh, for $20, or um, for those who teach in an institution, they can get an institutional copy, and the funds go to support the work at A New Way of Life and Critical Resistance. Mm. That's visionsofabolition.org. Uh, Setsu Shigematsu and Susan Burton, thank you both so much for joining us. Best of luck to you. Our pleasure. I'd also like to give the website of A New Way of Absolutely. Life. Absolutely. So if uh, people want more I information on A New Way of Life, our website website is a new way of life org, and they can check out the work that we're doing and the programs that we run. Wonderful. Thanks again, Susan. Thank, Thank you. you.